Arab nation would be looking at Eastinians in the Caribbean. We would be looking at how Eastinians came from India and what they've been doing in the Caribbean over the last 160 years. Welcome to Carib Nation. I am Paul Nero Tennessee. Today we will be looking at East Indians in the Caribbean. We will be examining many aspects of the Caribbean people's li lives in with respect to the East Indians. For example, how did they get from India to the Caribbean? And over the last 160 years, what they have been doing in the Caribbean. Carib Nation has put together a group of panelists who are very eminent, people who have studied the Caribbean and East Indians in the Caribbean. I have with me here today Dr. Mahain Gosain, Professor of Sociology and Anthropology from New York City. I also have here Dr. Dan Paul Narain, Professor on Education from New York City, and Mrs. Mala Rampata, who is a businesswoman, broadcaster, and journalist. Dr. Gosain, can you give us an idea how East Indians really came to the Caribbean uh, from India? In what year and under what conditions did they come? East Indians in the Caribbean came during the indenture period. And the indenture period lasted for about 82 years. From about 1834, uh, when the indenture system started to Mauritius, Mauritius was the first country that received indentured uh, Indians, and the system was ended in 1917. Yeah, but who, brought, who brought them from the Caribbean? I mean, was it the British who were ruling India that brought them to the right. Caribbean? It was the British, it was the French, and it was the Dutch. In the Caribbean, uh, there are a few countries with significant numbers of Indians. For example, in Guyana. Uh, Guyana has nearly 55% of Indians. Trinidad, about 45% of Indians. Um, Suriname also has significant uh, uh, numbers of Indians. Smaller numbers of Indians were brought to uh, Jamaica. Jamaica received about 37,000. Trinidad received 144,000. Guyana received 238,000. And much smaller numbers were brought to Grenada. They were brought to St. Vincent. They were brought to St. Lucia. They were brought to Martinique. They were brought to Guadeloupe. Um, as far as getting to the Caribbean, they came under the, the indenture system, and the indenture system was one in which they were contracted for a period of five years. But did they come on their own free will, or were they taken there by force, like Africans were, for example, from Africa? They were not necessarily taken by force. There was a recruiting system that helped uh, the Britishers and the French and the Dutch to bring East Indians. Most of them were, re were recruited. However, there was a tremendous amount of... Um, of devious tactics that many of the colonial powers used to bring them to the Caribbean. Now, in terms of what you asked about the second part of your question, uh, being brought to the Caribbean on the ships they were brought, there were a tremendous number of problems on the ships. Uh, for example, there was the outbreak of malaria, cholera, dysentery. Um, in one instance, I read where something like 17% of those who were brought on the Ulysses died on the voyage to the New World. And it is argued that something like a total of 12% of the indentured immigrants who were brought during the indenture period, especially to the Caribbean, about 12% uh, died on the way over. Dan Paul, give us an idea about when the East Indians came to the Caribbean, like Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, and so forth. They went into the sugar plantations and they went to occupy the places of ex-slaves because slavery was abolished of African people. What were the conditions like in indentureship? What were the plantations like? Was it exactly like slavery? Was it similar to slavery? Give us an idea what it was like. Well, thank you. And first of all, it's a pleasure to be a Caribbean nation. Now, to answer your question, uh, East Indians were replacing uh, the ex-slaves after emancipation in 1838 on the plantations. Uh, the conditions were somewhat similar. In fact, Adamson has written a very good book called Sugar Without Slaves. 
1972. And what he was saying is that East Indian indentorship was a new form of slavery, in that the laws were the same. You cannot leave the plantations without a pass. Uh, some of the brutalities were the same. For example, I, was, I have read that there have been examples where workers who disobeyed were being whipped on their backs yes. and they put salt and pepper yes. on their backs. Yes, as they did to the slaves on the plantations. Yeah. And uh, the whole idea under the plantation system after emancipation was to divide and rule the, the East Indians uh, and the Negroes at that time. So that the system, uh, again to answer your question, is a new, was a new form of slavery and East Indians on the plantations will tell you uh, that, uh, and scholars will tell you who have done the research, that conditions were very much similar. Mohan, you want to say I, something? I just wanted to add that it was basically, according to Krishna Bahadur Singh, he said it was a modified version of slavery. That's essentially what it was. Though I must say that towards the end of the indenture period in particular, uh, the system began to, be, to become somewhat relaxed. For example, there are instances, at least in the Trinidad indenture system, I don't know uh, what happened in Guyana in that respect, but as far as Trinidad is concerned, you could have still worked on the plantations. You could continue to work on the plantations as an indentured worker. But if you got married, for example, take for example my grandfather, when he got married, he was able to move out of the barracks and live with his wife close to the plantations, though he was still under contract. Mala, the, the, there is a view, for example, in Guyana that um, the family system of the Indian people, the difference with slavery was that they were able to keep their religion and they were able to keep their family unit. Um, how, much, how, how much truth is there to that within the indentureship system? Well, I think there's a lot of validity to that statement. In fact, um, I would say that women were really, in the beginning of the indentureship period, were the main channel in which Indian domestic culture was maintained and retained. And let me just go back a little in terms of the, the journey of Indian women from India. Uh, on the first ship that sailed from, Cal uh, from Calcutta into Guyana was a ship called the Whitby. And not very many women came in those days. And uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the planters, the British back then, did not find the importation of women economically profitable on the plantation. So not many women came in the beginning. The second reason is that the men, the Indian men that came on those ships, uh, though they were married, intended to return back to India. As Dr. Gosain mentioned, they were here on a five-year indentureship period. So they had intended to return to India, and thus they left their wives behind. So that was the second reason not many women came in the beginning. Uh, the third uh, reason is if we look at the, the quote-unquote, the status or the kinds of women that came, and perhaps this is where um, we have a bit of a dark history because the women that came in the beginning uh, were of a certain background. Most of them were single. A lot of them were widowed and therefore not, allow, uh, not allowed to be remarried. And a lot of them were separated from their husbands. So in the beginning, this was, these you know, uh, were the backgrounds of the women that came. So it wasn't so, um, so simple as saying that you had a consolidated family system. There were difficulties, there were problems. Oh yes, oh yes. And I remember stories that my grandmother would tell us. I mean, she came and um, you asked earlier, uh, you know, what, what were the Indians told in India uh, in terms of uh, the journey across the Kalapani, as we refer to it. And a lot of them were misled. Uh, my grandmother told stories where they were locked up for two, three days in like a station, and they were told that they were going to other parts of India. Uh, many were told that they were going to the land of opportunities, and um, they were going to become more affluent. You know, so yeah, because I also read that there were cases of workers who thought they were they were not far away from India, exactly. and they were actually in trying to escape. Mm -hmm. They were su trying to swim over the river. Mm -hmm. uh, Mohain, I wanted to ask you about I, this. I, I just yeah, wanted to yeah, follow okay, up on what Mala had to oh, say, okay. and she's quite right on this on that score. They used a lot of devious practices to Trickery. recruit the Indians 
And this went on in uh, Chotanagpur. Who did it? Indians did it or the British did it? Some of the Indian agents did Indian it. Indian agents. Indian as well managers. as the colonialists, as well they did the it colonial. too. Mm -hmm. And this happened around Calcutta where the first set started to come from, the Chotanagpur area, and then it moved northward to the Bihar area and the Uttar Pradesh districts. But in terms of what Marla was saying, that initially I was looking at uh, Moses Sinarine's work, who just finished his uh, PhD, his doctoral dissertation at Columbia. And Moses argued that at first, when the indenture system had gotten started, by the 1840s and 1850s, 35 percent of those who came were women. Mm -hmm. Then by the 1880s and 1890s, that figure had jumped to 50 percent. And then by 1914, three years before the end of the indenture system, it had fallen to 40 percent. Moses also argues that a lot of the women who came were Dalits. And Mali is quite right on that score. They were Dalits, they were lower caste women. And they were basically regarded as, as, as people who didn't have uh, any kind of lucrative future in India. And Moses also has some numbers. He says that about of all the Indians who came, which was more than half a million to the Caribbean, about 66,000 repatriated. That's very, that's very interesting. If I may just try yes, to combine the two strands yeah. briefly. Um, yes, in Guyana, at the end, towards the end of the indentureship period, there was some modification of the rules in that mixing was allowed, people could leave the plantations freely um, and things like that. The second question is, to what extent did the plantocracy allow East Indians to keep their culture intact? And uh, it was more or less at the behest of the plantocracy that East Indians kept their marriage systems, their Ramayan, their Quran, um, and so on, because they didn't want too much mixing between ex-slaves. Because of solidarity. Exactly, class exactly. Solidarity. They didn't want too much mixing. And if you look at the system of settlement in places like Trinidad and British Guyana, you will find that there were separate villages that were created for East Indians yeah. and blacks to prevent this kind of intermixing, and hence solidarity. In, in any form of oppression, whether it was slavery or semi-slavery, neo-slavery, uh, as a historian, what we do, we look at things like, um, we say that people either adapt, they either commit suicide, they mm -hmm. either escape, they, or they either rebel, or they either, uh, you know, resist. What, what was the situation with indentureship? Was there a history of resistance, a history of adaptation? Was it all four, all five? Actually, how, was, how did it evolve? It was a combination of all of the things you mentioned. Some committed suicide. Yeah. Another tactic they used was to fake illness. Another tactic they used was to um, was to speak out against the overseers. Um, many also decided that they were going to run away. Uh, so th there were a combination of tactics that they used. In terms of armed resistance, not armed. I mean strikes right. and so forth. Armed resistance to the point where. Uh, uh, it happened in this country, for example, in the system of slavery. No. There were strikes. There were strikes in the 1880s, for example. Um, I think Basdeo Mangru has some work on this, and Basdeo talks about the fact that in the 1880s, late 1880s, and until 1892, uh, there were a number of strikes that they did in Georgia. And when did indentureship end? Example? Well, in 1917 in Guyana, British Guyana. April 15, 1917. 1917. And in Trinidad? The same year. The, the entire indenture system came when to an end across in the board. 1917. So April 15th would be the date across the board too? Right. That came That's about. That's very interesting. Yeah, that yeah. came about because of uh, what was happening with the Indian National Congress at the time. Pandit Madan Mohan Malavia, uh, people like Balwant Singh, Motilal Nehru, who was all spearing this Gandhi. Well, I, well, I was told that yeah. when Gandhi, after Gandhi confronted apartheid yeah. in South Africa and he became radicalized, right. he went back to India and one of the things he did in the Congress party was to, was to lobby that no more Against should overseas in yeah. Indians be sent overseas because they were being exploited and their human rights were being violated. Precisely. Is that a but, fact? But that is a fact. Oh, so definitely. Gandhi played an important role Gandhi in the Gandhi played an important role, but Gandhi came later. He it came was later. really yeah. Madan Mohan Malavia uh, was the one who took up the whole issue and argued the case in the Indian Congress. 
Mala, you, you, you made a reference about your grandparents and about some wanting to stay, some going back. Mm -hmm. Why after the indentureship had a contract and it had an expiration date, why after the dates expired for indentureship, why did the Indians did not go back to India? What made them stay on in Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica and all these other islands? Oh, very simply because also they were starting to uh, have their roots settled in, in Guyana and in other countries well, is it in the not Caribbean. true that I was told that they, uh, and I have read that um, the plantation owners in order, after the end of indentureship, they had learned what had happened after slavery, that the Africans decided that they're going to leave the plantations and, and go on. And so they didn't want the migration of labor again to move away from planting, mm -hmm. that they give them um, plots of land to cancel right. their tickets. Yeah, but yeah, then can you, you see, develop Paul, that you a see, bit more? In, in the process of the indentureship, things began to change for better. And as Indians, as the farmers, in the beginning they started to lease the land towards the end of indentureship. And um, I think what they were finding is that, uh, coming back to the fact of wanting to settle down there in Guyana and to start their roots, it was to some extent a lucrative uh, situation. Dan Paul, you want to say okay, something? Okay, there are two, two quick things we need to connect here. And the first okay. is uh, East Indian values, customs, tradition, culture. Um, Slavery, if you c compare and contrast indentureship to slavery, the whole design of slavery was meant to break up the family. In other words, mothers should be separated from fathers, brothers, and sisters, and American experience is a good testimony to that. Whereas indentureship, they didn't mind parents being together with their children, uh, brothers and sisters being together. They didn't, they didn't mind people having their priests with them, their holy texts with them, their marriage institution, and their that religious... That was tolerated. Institution. That yeah, was tolerated. There wasn't a breakup within the family. Because, okay. because, it, because if you separate, you can rule. But well, what the about second, the issue of land? Okay, the second point. The second point mm -hmm. about land. Uh, you are, the question you ask is why is it that they prefer to stay right. rather than return? Mm -hmm. And there are two reasons why. One is land, and second is kinship. Land and kinship. The history of East Indians, mm -hmm. the world over, especially those who have left India, has been an affinity between them and the land. The soul of East Indian is connected to the land. We're going to take a break now, and we are going to come back and continue to look at some of these issues about on East Indians in the Caribbean. Don't switch your TV off. Do come back. If we're going to talk the talk, we better walk the walk until our work, until our work is done, yeah. There's a better world that we can be in if we all just take the time to leave an old child behind. Welcome back to Carib Nation. We are discussing East Indians in the Caribbean. Gosain, I w would like us now to discuss a bit, and Dan Paul and Mala, I, I would like to discuss a bit now a very important issue. East Indians came with the identity that they were East Indians from India to the Caribbean. They have lived through that whole period from over uh, nearly 160 years, independence and all that. What do they consider, how do they consider themselves now as um, Caribbean people, as Indo-Caribbean people, as West Indians? How do they define their identity now? And what explain, or how, how do you explain the changes that have occurred in their lives and their culture and their identity over the years on these new land spaces? I think that when you look at trying to forge a Caribbean East Indian identity, you have to look at that identity of forging that identity over a period of time. Meaning simply that by the turn of the 20th century, Indians would have regarded themselves as a part of the Caribbean, but the African segment of the population, chances are, were not willing to accept that. 
As time went on, and as Indians began to get into the educational arena, as they began to get into the political arena, as they began to emerge as the petty bourgeois of the country and so on, we began to see them carving out an identity more and more for themselves. To this day, there is still some argument as to whether or not East Indians are an integral part of Trinidadian society. Um, the Indians you meet, they will tell you definitely, yes, we are. But at the same time, they don't see themselves as just people who live in a society where we can talk about nationhood. We can talk about nationhood, but we have to understand that within these nations, there are a medley of ethnic groups, each one wanting to have its own identity. So there's a kind of cultural pluralism, and the debate rages on. Now, uh, Sam Selvan, who passed away so a few years really ago. So what you're really saying is that the racial identity is paramount to the national identity? Precisely. So, but, do, but, but what I'm saying is that when they were in India, they were called East Indians. Correct. Now they're in the Caribbean. What, what, do, what do they call themselves? Are they, Dan Paul, are they Indo-Caribbeans? Are they Indo-Guyanese? Are they Indo-Trinidadians? Well, are they East Indian Trinidadians? What, what, well, what comes, label is it used? It comes back to the point uh, one had made earlier, and that deals with nationalism. See, nationalism requires two things. One, a sense of ideology, and two, the wherewithal to implement this ideology. Remember, as early as a generation ago, East Indians were not quite sure wh whether they were East Indians <coughs> or whether they were British subjects or Guyanese. In fact, Mr. J.D. Tyson, the East Indian immigration agent general, was sent by the government of India in 1940, as recent as 1940, to agitate for East Indian rights in British Guyana and, the, and plantations. This was a man from India who went to British Guyana, the Sugar States, to campaign for East Indian rights. But we are rights. talking about now. Mala but now, what happened? We what are happened talking now? about now, yeah. But I think up until now, wow. actually, if Indians in the Caribbean do not consider and are not accepted as West Indians, the only time, I think the only time we're really accepted as West Indians is when we come out to play the sport of cricket, then we're all together and we're all one. We're seen as West Indians, the black community and the Indian community, and perhaps in Trinidad more so now with, the, uh, with Carnival. But if you, if you think of the Caribbean from a more worldly perspective, well, what comes to mind first is the black community. You do not think of So you're Indian saying that the, the Caribbean, Caribbean has a stamp of the African rather than the stamp of the East Indian. Absolutely. There is, there's yes. an absence yes. of the stuff. Now, but, but this brings me a question Caribbean. I'd like you to, 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 to focus on. Give me an idea about some instances or good examples of how the culture of Indians have either been retained or modified being in Trinidad and Guyana and the Caribbean. Because I think that's because I know that you have the religion, right. you have the Indian movies and so forth. But there also been um, acculturation been modified, occurring and transacculturation. Let Mohain, for example, the, the Afro Trinidadians um, identify with Calypso. And all, tri all, all Caribbean people do. But they know it's uh, African uh, for, uh, format. Um, uh, they, they contributed to it. But I know in Trinidad, they also have been able, the Indians, to parallel that with the Chutney. There's Can you tell us more right? about this kind of mm -hmm. acculturation and transacculturation? In any society where you have a medley of ethnic groups, any multi-ethnic society, there would be a certain amount of mixing. And that mixing would take place at a cultural level, and it would also take place at a structural level. Assimilation both culturally and structurally. Chutney, if you listen to Chutney carefully, it has a lot of Indian lyrics in it. But Chutney also has a lot of English lyrics, and it has lyrics pertaining to the local dialects. But yet, Chutney also has very much of a Calypso beat. Now, Calypso, of course, as we well know, was, sta was started in the hills of Lavantil by the African segment of the population. And part of the whole emergence of Calypso had to do with a kind of reaction, you know, black folk singing these songs about, against the colonial masters and it created a sense of uh, unity and group mm -hmm. uh, solidarity and so on. So the Indians have taken that. Now in Trinidad today, for example, Mal and myself were talking about this before the show, um, we were talking about... Um, the extent to which Indians are participating in carnival. 
in the old days, mm -hmm. you wouldn't find a lot of Indians participating in carnival. Now, some of the best bands in Trinidad are very much uh, uh, played in uh, by Indians. Um, Indians also some of the best pan men in Trinidad, where traditionally most of the pan men were of the African segment of the population. But I, there's a, something that I've always thought about and wondered whether it doesn't have to do with this problem of identifying with the nation states. When the Africans were freed from slavery, they celebrate the day that they had emancipation. I find that East Indians celebrate what they call arrival day which was the very first day that they entered indentureship, the very first day they entered semi-slavery. Why is it East Indians did not, do not celebrate the end of indentureship rather than the beginning of indentureship? And what connection does that have to do with their whole ideology and their whole consciousness in terms of nationalism with regard to these countries? It what? has to do with reactionary politics. Okay. And this is something I have thought about. When you look at the celebration of Arrival Day, which is in May, late May. But Indian Arrival Day and its celebration did not come about until Emancipation Day, which is in August. Emancipation Day for the black community came about long before uh, uh, Indian Arrival Day. So once again, we see the Indians' reaction. The Indians felt that the African segment of the population now had a day whereby so which they can So why didn't they celebrate. react to the, to the day of liberation the day of rather liberation. than the day because, of entrance? Into because in a sense, there was no liberation. Oh, there was no liberation. 1917 marked the end of indenture. But I think one also has to understand it was a kind of transition. It wasn't dramatic. It, it wasn't was a rupture. That's right. As slavery was. Absolutely. As the end of slavery Precisely. was. Precisely. And what happened was the end of slavery in this country, for example, 1834, you know, with Wilberforce and then in the British Isles by 1838, what we began to see. This was a kind of worldwide uh, movement. Well, Dr. Gosen, that's a very good note for us to end this program. And I would like to thank you for having come on the program, Carib Nation. Dr. Dan Paul, I'd like to thank you. And Mala, I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all in the second series that we will do on East Indians in the Caribbean. Thank you very much. Thank you. East Indians in the Caribbean is a very fascinating experience. As you have heard, very poor people, some of them single parents, some of them uh, coming from the outcasts of India, went all the way to the Caribbean and made tremendous contributions creating new nation states. They have been able to have over 160 years very stable inter-ethnic, inter-racial relations in the Caribbean. This is Carib Nation once more saying thank you and we look forward to seeing you again in our next series.